Well, let's move on now to our next two guests. Joining us today is Dr. Mark Poli, a research scientist in the Toxinology Division at USAMRID, and Dr. David France, who is Vice President and responsible for the Chemical and Biological Defense Division of Southern uh, Research Institute. And Dr. France was also the previous commander of USAMRID. So if I call him Colonel, you understand. Thank you uh, both for joining us again this year. And let's, uh, let's talk about toxin. Ted, define a toxin. Well, Doris, toxins are interesting. They're not living, replicating uh, agents like the viruses and bacteria, and so people would ask, why are we talking about them uh, in a biological warfare course? Uh, some people, in fact, in the old Soviet Union, they often classified toxin-mediated diseases as chemical uh, warfare. But uh, the distinction we make in the United States is that these toxins, these chemicals, came from or were derived from living organisms, and that's why we classify them as biological agents. Uh, since I don't come in contact with these particular agents too often, and since I suspect uh, that most uh, clinicians in the United States really don't deal much with toxin-mediated diseases, I want to turn that discussion over uh, pretty much to Dr. France. Uh, Dr. France, what's the difference, or what are the differences between uh, toxins and chemical agents? Well, as you mentioned, uh, Ted, toxins... Uh, like chemicals are not living. They're not like bacteria or viruses in that they replicate in our bodies. So what you get is what you got if you're exposed. Uh, chemicals, toxins are really chemicals that are made by nature. They're made by animals, by plants, or by microorganisms. And there are, however, some very important physical differences, and this is the key. Uh, toxins are neither volatile nor are they dermally active. And so if you think about the Am Shinrikyo scenario, for example, in the Tokyo subway, even though botulinum toxin is maybe 10,000 times more toxic than the sarin that was used in that attack, botulinum toxin would not have worked because they used a very primitive sort of a weapon system in that they had sarin in plastic bags and then punctured the bag and the toxin came out based because of its high vapor pressure. It vaporized and came out and either made you sick or killed you. Yeah. Uh, that wouldn't happen with botulinum because it is not volatile. And that's an important consideration for a proliferator who might be interested in developing a weapon. All right. What type of toxins would work as a biological warfare agent? Well, there are actually hundreds of toxins, of biological toxins. Uh, but whether you're, uh, you're planning to use a, uh, develop a biological agent for a battlefield or for a street corner as a terrorist, you have to think about three factors. You have to think about the toxicity, the stability of the toxin, and the ease of production. And toxins that might be useful as weapons have to, have to score pretty high in all of those three areas. We're going to talk today about botulinum toxin, which is one of the most toxic of toxins. We're also going to talk about ricin, which is one that, that fits the ease of production uh, scenario. So uh, although there are hundreds of toxins that might be used, it's a very few, actually, that would be useful as weapons agents. Well, are there toxins that wouldn't make good weapons? Well, yes. Actually, we need to remember that although many toxins won't work on a large-scale battlefield, one that covers tens or hundreds of square kilometers, there may be toxins that are perfectly legitimate weapons in a smaller-scale area, in a room, uh, in, a, in a sports arena. Uh, they make excellent terrorist weapons, uh, and they make good weapons of assassination. Yeah, I just want to review that, uh, actually. And we talked about this a little bit uh, on the first day of this course. We divided these weapons into strategic, terrorist, and tactical uh, contexts. And uh, I think we said that really toxins would never make good strategic weapons, or at least I can't envision uh, them making good strategic weapons, because they don't have the stability uh, in the atmosphere in general. And, and they lack some of the other characteristics that would allow them to be disseminated over uh, big areas. Uh, you, you might say they could make a good tactical weapon, and I think we said that on the first day of the course. But on the other hand, some people would argue uh, that biological warfare in general doesn't really make good tactical mm -hmm. uh, sense because, um, again, they have incubation periods. So if I'm uh, a battlefield commander and I'm tasked with capturing that hill over there, what I really don't want to do is throw a weapon on that hill and sit around for several days and twiddle my thumbs mm -hmm. and wait for it to have its effect. Uh, so uh, in that sense, they perhaps don't make great tactical weapons as well. But I agree fully uh, with Dr. Pauly. Uh, I could certainly envision a terrorist use for them, and they certainly, some of them have brand name recognition uh, as terrorist weapons. Mm -hmm. And state-sponsored militaries can use them. You may have read recently in the past couple of years uh, about the Iraqi production of aflatoxins. 
Uh, aflatoxins are fungal metabolites. They're most closely associated with grain or peanuts. Uh, and we feel that they were produced by the Iraqis for the purpose of biological warfare. Now, we believe they weren't used, but uh, the fact that they were produced is very puzzling to us. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I've received uh, some questions about this aflatoxin. Um, I've never really known uh, uh, what, what their purpose was uh, in using them. I, Colonel France, I know you've been an UNSCOM uh, inspector. You've led inspection teams uh, to Iraq. What do you think about this? Uh, w why would the Iraqis have weaponized aflatoxin? Well, Ted, I don't think anyone really knows exactly why they did it. But I have a hyp hypothesis that I sort of developed uh, during my time over there working with Dr. Taha and, and the other key players in, in their program. I think they have political pressures and they live in a bureaucracy uh, in Iraq. And I would suspect that possibly Dr. Taha's team was under great pressure to produce a biological weapon. Someone probably understood how to grow large quantities of aflatoxin and decided that they would, they would weaponize it. Hmm. Just because they did that, they, they, they did it, uh, and just because they did doesn't, doesn't necessarily uh, mean, as, as Mark mentioned, that it is a, a good a tactical or, or strategic weapon. It, it, it might have had a, a terror component. There may have been a psychological component that would have been useful as a weapon. But with regard to causing acute illness, uh, it wouldn't be effective. Mm -hmm. Now for the uh, first toxin. Um, that even I have heard about. Don't you get botulism from eating contaminated food? Well, yes, Doris, you do. In fact, that's the usual route uh, of acquisition in peacetime. Botulism is acquired uh, typically by ingesting one of seven related uh, neurotoxins, and all seven of those are formed by uh, various strains of the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. Uh, this bacterium uh, is closely related to the bacterium that causes tetanus, Clostridium tetani, uh, and uh, as such, uh, and like tetanus, uh, it's readily found in soil virtually everywhere in the world. The interesting thing about this bacteria is that it typically doesn't harm you. Uh, ingesting minute quantities of the toxin will, but consuming the bacteria does not. And again, I think you all know we all consume little bits of dirt every day. You get dirt under your fingernails, you pick your teeth. I do not. Constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us. <laughs> you're, you're constantly ingesting uh, minute amounts mm -hmm. uh, of Clostridium botulinum organisms, and yet your stomach acid is able to deal with those. But it's, it's consuming the toxin that's the problem. Okay. Dr. Paul, what does a toxin do once you ingest it? Well, it binds to presynaptic nerve terminals. Now, in a normal cell, the electrical impulse traveling up the, up the nerve triggers the chemical release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. In the case of botulinum toxin, I think we've got, right, here's a, here's a video clip that'll depict Okay, that. well, let's look at this. Uh, normal nerve transmission, you've got uh, electrical impulse, you've got the release of neurotransmitter across the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. Acetylcholine in this case. In the case of botulism now, botulinum toxin binds to the presynaptic nerve terminal and interrupts the cellular mechanism that's involved in the chemical release of the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. This results in a lack of neurotransmitter in the, in the cleft. Okay, and this lack of acetylcholine, Doris, would result in the exact opposite effect that you would see uh, with a nerve agent, uh, where in the case of nerve agent, there's too much acetylcholine because the enzyme acetylcholinesterase uh, has been inhibited, and that, the enzyme, that's the enzyme that would normally break down that neurotransmitter. So with nerve agent intoxication, you get overexcited uh, nerves, you get muscle fasciculations, uh, and you get maybe a spastic paralysis. But with bot intoxication, uh, you see a gradual and more flaccid uh, paralysis. We'll go into that uh, in quite a bit of depth later on. Okay. Well, let's get back to in, uh, ingesting the toxin. That is the way you usually get it. Well, that is the way you usually get it. Uh, there are other ways of getting it. They're not as common. And I think Dr. France, uh, Dr. France can uh, probably describe for us how bot tox is formed. And then uh, with that knowledge, I can probably better explain how we can become intoxicated with that toxin. Well, as you mentioned, Ted, uh, bot is produced by a, a, a commonly found uh, soil pathogen. And historically, at least from a public health standpoint, the most common uh, mechanism of intoxication has been individuals canning either vegetables or meat, uh, as we see in, in this slide. Uh, what happens during the canning process is normally it's heated under pressure to a point that the bacteria are killed. If the process is not complete and, not, and the bacteria are not all killed, after the canning process, these bacteria wake up in an environment that's perfect for uh, the production of the toxin, low in oxygen in a sealed can, nutrients available, and so the bacteria produce the toxin. 
Then we open a can of green beans and think we'll just taste one before we heat it uh, to see whether uh, how they taste. And uh, one green bean can kill you because the toxin is so extremely toxic and is found, has been produced uh, after the canning process. Well, suppose you want to heat what you canned, if you want to heat it up, I mean, what happens then? Typically, if you heat botulinum toxin to boiling temperatures, you can uh, destroy the toxin. Okay, but by then you've ruined yeah. your product, right? <laughs> okay, Dr. Swerdlow of the CDC is in charge of the botulinum program. Let's hear what he has to say about the epidemiology of botulism. At the beginning of the century, cases of botulism increased largely due to the increased popularity of home preservation of foods, home canned foods. However, the numbers of cases decreased after educational efforts were disseminated to improve canning procedures. There was more availability of refrigeration. There were improved preservation techniques, and their cases actually came down. Since the 1960s, we've had an increased number of cases. This is largely um, due to new vehicles that we hadn't suspected before foods that are, do not have preservatives that are kept under anaerobic conditions, such as garlic under oil, even baked potatoes wrapped in, in foil. We've also had an increased number of restaurant-associated outbreaks, and we've also had problems with centralized production of food. So a, if a single product becomes uh, contaminated, then that can be widely distributed and it can cause a lot of people to become ill. There have been changes in the way foods are produced, which sometimes can take a safe product and make it an unsafe product. For example, uh, salsa made from tomatoes was basically a safe product and had been made for centuries. However, uh, people like tomatoes that don't have as much um, acidity in them, they're sweeter tasting. Um, but what's happened is that when you start using those tomatoes to make salsa, you've changed the pH and the uh, acidity of the, of the salsa. And that has caused outbreaks because that salsa does not have the, is not acid enough to prevent toxin production. So simple changes in, the, in food production can potentially cause food items that were safe to become dangerous. Another example is, is in the United Kingdom, they had a uh, uh, yogurt that was made with a hazelnut paste, and it was widely distributed. They changed the hazelnut paste from being made with sugar to being made with a sugar substitute. That simple change changed the water activity of that product and would now allow botulism spores to uh, germinate and toxin be produced. And that caused a widespread outbreak in the United Kingdom. So simple changes in food production can potentially make safe products unsafe now. You know, Doris, another way of getting exposed uh, to botulism toxin is through a wound that hasn't been properly cleansed. And mm. uh, uh, I think you can understand maybe how you could get that. Um, you get a wound and it gets sealed off somehow and uh, anaerobic conditions ensue uh, and the bacterium uh, is able to proliferate uh, under those conditions. It's similar uh, to what you would see in tetanus, but a very, very rare way uh, of contracting botulism. A third method uh, of contracting botulism uh, is familiar to probably most pediatricians in the audience, and that's uh, infant botulism. And here's an infant uh, who is under a year of age, and basically uh, I told you that eating Clostridium botulinum spores uh, is uh, by and large harmless because mm -hmm. our stomach acid destroys those spores. Infants, however, often don't have uh, the same degree of stomach acidity uh, that adults have. Uh, and it is rare, but not unheard of, that infants can get botulism from eating uh, the whole bacterial cells. Uh, honey is a food stuff that is typically um, has a high content of botulinum spores, and pediatricians used to tell parents uh, who had constipated young infants, give your uh, infant a spoon of honey, uh, and it'll relieve constipation. The problem in is, in, in rare cases, <laughs> right, it led to botulism. So pediatricians uh, don't recommend that anymore. And the infant would basically ingest the uh, Clostridium botulinum spore. It would proliferate in the gut and start cranking out toxin. And so uh, the syndrome you would see would be identical to that seen in foodborne disease, but a little bit different uh, mechanism of pathophysiology. Okay, can it be transmitted by aerosol? Well, uh, not normally. Um, it isn't contagious at all. Uh, none of the toxins, in fact, are. Um, and really, the only way for it to be transmitted by aerosol would be someone working with it in a laboratory who somehow uh, got it in their face or in an intentional uh, release by a terrorist or belligerent. Mm -hmm. That's, in fact, uh, in a biological warfare scenario, exactly what we would envision it being used. And, and speaking of distances, will it go uh, a long distance? No, it, it won't travel a long distance. It's not very stable in the natural environment. And in fact, computer scenarios that I've played with suggest that even under optimal conditions, it won't travel more than a few hundred meters. Right. However, that doesn't mean it's not a good terrorist weapon. 
uh, in an enclosed space, it, it would be a perfectly viable weapon. And of course, you can also use it to target food or water supplies. Right, right. And that gets back to what we were saying earlier. Certainly wouldn't make a good strategic weapon, but on mm -hmm. a smaller scale, perhaps a viable weapon. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not as effective over long distances as anthrax would be. But if you were in the, uh, in the aerosol cloud, does it cause the same disease um, as when you ingest it? Yes, uh, Doris. Actually, the, the mechanism of cellular mechanism of action that uh, Mark described earlier uh, is the same mechanism that occurs after an aerosol challenge. There are some differences, however. Uh, we have found in animal models that botulinum toxin inhaled appears to be, depending on the serotype, appears to be 20 to 80 times less potent. And this is probably because of absorption uh, mechanisms and binding in the lung and, and things like that. Uh, so there may be a delay in onset of the, the signs and symptoms, but they will be identical to those that are seen after either oral ingestion or injection of the toxin. Okay, now we know how it causes disease, but what happens to the patient, Ted? Well, Doris, uh, first, of course, there's an incubation period. I, I don't know if incubation period is the right term in terms of toxins, but there's a latent period uh, after an inhaled dose uh, of botulism. Uh, and then the clinical disease starts after approximately 24 to 36 hours uh, in most cases, uh, sometimes as late as several days. Um, lower doses, of course, would take longer incubation periods and higher doses would, uh, would probably present uh, more quickly. Um, bulbar uh, palsies, bulbar paralysis, uh, would be uh, what you would see early on with eye symptoms such as blurry vision uh, due to the medriasis, the diplopia, the ptosis, and the photophobia that would go along uh, with a case of botulism. Those are evident, uh, I believe, in a uh, uh, slide we have here. Um, as a pediatrician, I can tell you all teenagers look like this to a degree, mm -hmm. but this is an unfortunate mm -hmm. teenager uh, who uh, contracted botulism. And what you notice about this uh, uh, youngster is he's unable to move his facial muscles. So he's unable to smile. Uh, he's even unable to lift his eyelids. Uh, you also get dysarthria and dysphonia and dysphagia, so he can't swallow. Uh, mm -hmm. He can't uh, swallow his secretions. Um, you get uh, extreme dryness of the mouth and throat, uh, and you're supposed to notice here that the tongue uh, is quite dry. But what kills you is that this uh, paralysis progresses uh, distally to involve all skeletal muscles, uh, particularly the skeletal muscles that control uh, respiration, the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. It presents clinically as a symmetrical, descending, progressive weakness, uh, and again, abruptly culminates uh, in respiratory failure. It can progress rather quickly. Uh, in fact, with some cases of foodborne botulism, uh, you go from the first signs of botulism, first symptoms, uh, as far as death in mm -hmm. as little as 24 hours. Um, and again, you saw that in that teenager. He was put on uh, artificial ventilation and fortunately lived happily ever after. I want to stress to the clinicians out there that with everything in medicine, there's a differential diagnosis, and that certainly applies to botulism as well. If you were out there on the battlefield and you saw a single case of this flaccid uh, paralysis, you would have to entertain uh, diagnoses such as uh, myasthenia gravis, uh, the Eaton-Lambert syndrome, um, maybe poliomyelitis, even though that's basically gone in the Western Hemisphere, um, uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, things like that. Uh, maybe even nerve agent intoxication on the battlefield. Uh, if you saw 20 cases, there's no way that 20 cases of myasthenia gravis are going to come into the mm -hmm. same treatment facility uh, clustered in, in space and time. So a very easy diagnosis, or at least it should be a very easy diagnosis to make on the battlefield. And again, the real differential on the battlefield uh, is going to be botulism versus nerve agent intoxication. And we're going to talk at length later in the show uh, about how to make that distinction. Okay, so that, that's what you'll see in the patient. Right. All right. Right. Hopefully not the death part. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you should see them when they present initially. Uh, probably all they're going to have uh, is uh, a little bit of weakness. Um, they're probably not going to have a fever. They're probably still going to be uh, alert and oriented. Maybe they'll have some postural hypotension uh, initially. Uh, and again, they're going to complain initially of weakness and maybe the bulbar symptomatology associated with that weakness, the blurry vision. Mm -hmm. uh, you might notice dilated pupils if you do a thorough uh, exam. On neurologic exam, uh, they may have some degree of muscle weakness. And here's our teenager demonstrating uh, the medriasis. Uh, if you uh, pursue your physical exam as you should, uh, you'll notice an absent uh, gag reflex. Uh, deep tendon reflexes may be present, may be absent. Um, okay. Well, let's listen to Dr. David Swirlow outline the differential diagnosis between botulism and other diseases. 
If you have a patient with a suspect case of botulism, a patient with cranial nerve dysfunction, descending symmetrical motor paralysis with sensory nervous system preserved, then the first thing you need to do is rule out a couple of other common syndromes. Some of those other syndromes include myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, stroke syndrome, and toxin ingestions. Um, that can be done with, a, with a, a scan of the head in MR or a CAT scan to rule out stroke syndrome, uh, lumbar puncture to rule out Guillain-Barre, although early on in Guillain-Barre you may not have an elevated protein which is characteristic of Guillain-Barre. So you need to be suspicious that a, a patient could still have Guillain-Barre even with a normal protein. A uh, tensilon test can rule out myasthenia gravis. The other thing you can do if you have a suspect case of botulism is perform an EMG. And this needs to be a specialized EMG, EMG with rapid repetitive stimulation. It needs to be done by someone who knows that they're looking for botulism and do the, does the special rapid repetitive stimulation to look for an augmented response that can be typical of, of botulism. If you have a suspect case of botulism, you um, should call the state health department who can then contact CDC 24 hours a day. CDC provides clinical consultation and can help decide whether appropriate confirmatory testing should be done and whether antitoxin should be administered. It should be kept in mind that you really can't wait for the confirmatory tests in order to act on a possible case of botulism. Uh, the earlier you administer the antitoxin, the better, and thus we do not wait for a confirmatory test in order to administer the antitoxin. In addition, any case of foodborne botulism is a, an emergency because we need to be sure that there isn't other uh, food products out there that can make other people sick. So contacting the state health department is very important to be able to begin any investigation to prevent anyone else from becoming ill. Okay, Doris, I think the point that the clinician out there should remember uh, is again, if you see a cluster uh, of paralytic disease out there on the battlefield, there's not a whole lot that can be other than botulism. Uh, I think you need to think of a large point source outbreak, and that could be foodborne uh, or possibly the result uh, of an aerosol delivery of bot toxin. Okay, now Dr. Swergo mentioned antitoxin for treatment, so how do you treat the disease? Well, it's important to note, Doris, that prior to 1950, botulism had a mortality rate as high as 60%. With modern uh, medical care now and ventilatory assistance and intensive care, supportive care, we've been able to decrease uh, that mortality rate to less than 5%. But uh, it becomes much, much more difficult to provide that supportive care uh, once your casualty numbers start to increase. I think it's safe to say that no military medical unit has uh, enough ventilators to treat all their mm -hmm. soldiers. The average battalion aid station doesn't carry uh, a thousand ventilators and it's <laughs> go-to-war stock. The good news is, though, uh, that we have something uh, besides supportive care uh, to rely on and to help us uh, take care uh, of these patients. And I think Dr. France would be best suited uh, to tell us about the antitoxins available. Yes, Ted, there are actually three antitoxins available. Uh, the first is a dispeciated heptavalent equine antitoxin. It's called heptavalent because it ha contains antibodies against A through G, serotypes A through G. It's called dispeciated because uh, the antibodies are produced by immunizing horses and the antibodies are taken out of horses by plasmapheresis. This is actually a photograph of First Flight, one of the most famous, hor famous horses that was used to produce some of this heptavalent uh, antitoxin. Still living at Fort Detrick, by the way. Uh, dispeciated because when they take the antibody out, they take out the IgG, and if you know what an IgG molecule looks like, it has an FC portion down on the bottom. That's the part that looks like a horse, if it was produced in a horse. So you cut that off with an enzymatic process, leaving just the business end of the antibiotic. That's called a FAB2, and that, is, that makes it dispeciated. Uh, that was produced by the Army. There's also a human pentavalent uh, shown here, which was produced by the Army as well. It has... Uh, it's called a bot immune globulin. This was done by immunizing humans, then taking their antibodies out, and they can be used for treatment. In that case, you don't need to speciate them, of course, so it's the whole IgG. Uh, Dr. Steve Arnon, a pediatrician in California, all pr also produced some of this material and did a recent clinical study in which he demonstrated efficacy in infants with infant bot. The third product is one that's available through the CDC produced by Connaught Laboratories a number of years ago, and it contains antibodies against A, B, and E. So it's called a trivalent. Antibodies are produced in equine, in horses, but in that case, they did not remove the FC portion, so it's not a dispeciated uh, product. I should point out that 
All of these products are available in rather uh, sh short supply. Mm -hmm. I think we may have a film clip uh, that will show us uh, exactly the mechanism of action uh, of some of these antitoxins. And if we could roll that film clip, maybe you could narrate for us yes. uh, what's going on here. Uh, this is very similar to what we saw uh, in the one that, that Mark described earlier. Here, the pink balls are the toxin which would, in the, pa in the previous, uh, previous film clip, blocked the, uh, the action of the release of, of uh, acetylcholine. In this case, the yellow balls came in, blocked the toxin so that they could not bind to the presynaptic uh, receptors, and the uh, acetylcholine got, yeah, acetyl, uh, mm -hmm. got through. Great, sure. great. I want to point out that because of the serum sickness question involved in these equine antitoxins, before anyone administers the antitoxin, uh, they should first test uh, their patient for horse serum sensitivity. And this is done uh, by injecting a one-tenth of an ml uh, dose of a one to ten dilution uh, of the antitoxin intradermally, uh, much in the same way you would do a PPD uh, test for tuberculosis, and then monitoring that patient uh, for 20 minutes. And if the injection site then becomes uh, erythematous uh, or the patient develops uh, fever, chills, hypotension, or any other signs of a, a reaction, respiratory distress, nausea, vomiting, uh, generalized itching, then the skin test would be considered positive. And before you would proceed then to give antitoxin, uh, it would be incumbent on you to desensitize that patient first. If the test is negative, uh, then the intravenous antitoxin dose can be given, and that would be 10 uh, milliliters given, uh, again, intravenously over 20 minutes, and you'd observe the patient, of course, for improvement. Okay, now would you actually do that, Ted, if you had a thousand patients exposed? Well, this, uh, I think you would. Um, and the reason I say that I realize fully uh, that doing this on a thousand patients seems cumbersome. Um, and seems to be a triage issue, and in a sense it is. Uh, so you would take into account your resources, but uh, I want to tell you, you're going to give this antitoxin intravenously anyway. So these patients are going to be in a facility uh, of sorts. They're going to be occupying a bed uh, of sorts, however primitive that bed space may be. Uh, they're going to need to have an IV line started. Okay. Um, and so I don't think it's much more uh, of a hoop to jump through to put that skin test on. Okay. What about animal studies, Dr. Franz? Uh, during the Gulf War, actually, we did animal studies in monkeys, challenging them with uh, ser serotype A of botulinum toxin by inhalation, and then either pre-treating them or treating them, uh, prophylaxing them or pre-treating them with either the human uh, BIG, the, the bot immune globulin, or the equine in, uh, despeciated product, and found that it was very efficacious. If you can get this material into the patient, into the rhesus monkey in my case, uh, before the onset of clinical signs, you just don't see clinical signs. And a little antibody goes a long way. But the key is getting it in before the onset of clinical signs because after signs have occurred, there is obviously toxin in some isolated compartment within the body that the antibody can't get to. And so it will still mop up what's out there in the circulation but the antibody probably doesn't get to what's uh, in there uh, at the uh, presynaptic neuron. Okay, so Dr. Pauly, since this is a toxin and you can diagnose it the same way, uh, can you diagnose it the same way as a bacteria and viruses? Um, yes and no. In the case of a toxin, what you do is you look for the toxin directly. In this case, botulized, botulinum toxin is such an exquisitely toxic compound that it's very difficult to find it in the bloodstream or anywhere else because it's there in such tiny amounts. However, you may be able to find, uh, may be able to detect it in nasal exudates if you catch that within a few hours after exposure. Um, and by the same token, even afterwards, even convalescent, there's, because there's such a tiny amount of toxin there, uh, people typically don't have an immune response, so you can't even check for antibodies like you could for a virus or a bacteria. Mm. You know, even if you can't do specialized tests, though, uh, if you suspect this and or if you suspect any uh, of these bio-warfare diseases we're talking about in, in this context today, uh, I would urge the clinician out there to obtain whatever samples they think are appropriate and stockpile those away uh, for later use, whatever that use may be. All right. Let's review the key points about botulism. The incubation period is one to five days. The symptoms terminate in a paralysis that causes respiratory failure, and only very specialized laboratory tests exist to kind of help you out, so you need to think about it clinically. That's absolutely. Right. Um, Dr. Franz, what, um, what about prevention measures? Well, there is an IND pentavalent, A, B, C, D, E, uh, toxoid. This is a formalin-treated 
uh, toxin, which makes a toxoid, much like tetanus toxoid, that has been tested in primates extensively, is uh, very protective in the case of primates, and it's been used in our laboratory workers for many years to provide them protection in working with the agent. Uh, the beauty of botulinum is that in this case we have an excellent surrogate marker. If you have antibody, which you get as a result of being immunized with the toxoid, you're protected uh, based on our animal studies. There's also a new recombinant product that was developed at USAMRID over the last uh, six or eight years. It's a piece of the, uh, the toxin, about a third of the toxin that's expressed for in another system. Uh, it's going to be the next generation vaccine. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to be cleaner. It may not be more efficacious because the old toxoid is very, very efficacious as well. But on the other hand, it might be better because uh, there's no formalin involved in this one. So there's no cross-linking of key epitopes on that piece of protein. So that's coming up in the future. Now, wasn't this vaccine used in the Gulf War? Yes. We immunized about 8,000 uh, service personnel during the Gulf War. Most of those were special operating uh, forces and others that were uh, believed to be at high risk. Ted, were there any side effects to the vaccine? Well, Doris, there weren't any long-term side effects. Uh, certainly, there were some minor uh, local reactions, redness, uh, edema, induration, and those seemed to increase somewhat with each successive dose. Severe reactions, though, uh, such as extensive edema, extensive uh, induration, uh, are very, very rare. Uh, systemic reactions with fever, malaise, headache, and myalgia uh, were reported in roughly 3% of recipients. Okay. Now, Ted was able to give some instruction when he was down at Fort Bragg with the 28th Combat Support Hospital. So we're going to go back to the 28th and we're going to listen to a case presentation. Okay, today we're going to discuss the case of Specialist Kern. Where are you from, Kern? New Jersey, sir. Great. Before we do the actual patient discussion, though, let me set the stage here. The scenario is this. It's 1998, and we're at war with the Soviet Union. The nations of the former Soviet Union have decided they really weren't doing very well on their own. They reformed the new and improved Soviet Union, and now they're not messing around. They're not taking any chances. They've launched a, uh, a full-scale assault over the pole through Canada and have plunged deep into the heartland of the United States. And right now, the front lines of the battle are raging in and around that critical government think tank at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. You, though, are here with the 28th Cache at Sleepy Fort Bragg, a thousand miles from the front. Nothing going on here at all. Very quiet day at the 28th when in staggers Specialist Curran. And his story goes something like this. Three days ago, he was pulling guard duty. Some kind of alarm went off. He really wasn't sure what this alarm meant, but all his buddies started getting their mop gear. He figured he better get in his mop gear, too. But he didn't have his mop gear with him. So he runs back to his tent to try to get his mop gear, trips on the way, hurts his leg, ends up taking him 10 minutes to get in his mop gear. But 30 minutes later, the all-clear sounds, gets out of his mop gear, and other than a sore ankle, he feels fine. For the next two days, he goes about his duties, no problem, feels fine. Now on the morning of day three, he staggers into your sleepy aid post here at the 28th cache, and he says, you know, Doc, gotta help me. Having a hard time, can't catch my breath. Feel real weak. What do you guys think going on with Curran here? The flu. Flu, good, where are you from, Pruitt? Georgia. Georgia, good. Flu, absolutely. Influenza, very common disease. It occurs in wartime just as well as in peacetime. And in a scenario like this, especially a scenario a thousand miles from the front line, it's far more likely you're going to be thinking garden variety types of diseases like the flu. Maybe he's got the flu. Maybe he's got mono. Maybe he's just scared that he's going to be sent to the front. Maybe he's worried about his mama back in New Jersey. Maybe he's worried about his girlfriend back in New Jersey. A lot of other things could be going on with Curran, and probably, playing the odds, those things are far more likely than anything real sinister like chemical or biological warfare. Okay, in a chem-bio warfare context, what could this be? Nerve agent? Nerve agent, really good. Good, so this could be nerve agent. At least nerve agent would give you some of the features of Curran's condition here. Now, when you start to approach this, on the battlefield, I tend to find that students get real confused. You know, there's a dozen different uh, chemical agents, dozen different biological agents going through their mind, and it gets real difficult trying to sort those out. So what I like to ask students to do is envision this two-by-two two table. We're looking at, is this a pulmonary syndrome versus a neuromuscular syndrome? And then we're looking at, does this present in delayed fashion, or does this present in immediate fashion? So the first question is, is this a pulmonary syndrome, or is it a neuromuscular syndrome? And how would you differentiate those two? Well, you can take a stethoscope here, and you could listen to his chest. So if I take a stethoscope here, 
I'm going to listen to this guy's chest. And if this were primarily a pulmonary syndrome, I might hear Rawls, Ronchi, a lot of congestion in his chest. But I don't hear that here. So this doesn't seem to be primarily a pulmonary syndrome. This seems to be a case of Kern's not able to breathe or he's having trouble breathing, but it's not because there's anything wrong with his lungs. It's because the muscles that operate the lungs don't work properly. And in fact, if I examine other muscles, if I were to lift up his arm, for example, then I would find the same thing. So I'm going to pick his arm up, and you notice it just drops right back down to the gurney. So he seems to have a neuromuscular syndrome rather than a pulmonary syndrome. And you guys are exactly correct when you say that nerve agent intoxication can produce a neuromuscular syndrome. Okay, now how would you differentiate nerve agent intoxication from something else this might be? And again, nerve agent intoxication is a chemical uh, effect. What about biological weapons? Any biological weapon that could cause this, anybody? Botulism. Botulism, Jackson, good. So this could be botulism or it could be nerve agent intoxication. And to the army truck driver, those two might be confusing, but to a bunch of highly trained medics, there are some very simple ways of differentiating nerve agent intoxication from botulism. And how would you tell the difference between, between those two entities? Secretions. Secretions, good. So what would you expect the nerve agent casualty to look like secretion-wise? Wet. Wet, yes. absolutely. So the nerve agent casualty looks a lot like you looked last time you staggered out of the gas chamber. They're drooling, they're slobbering, snots pouring out their nose, tears running out their eyes. What would you expect the bot casualty to look like? Dry. Dry, yeah. absolutely, Maynard, good. So. The bot casualty, they may have a little bit of drool because their muscles of swallowing are so weak, but in general, you'd expect their tongue and their lips and their gums to be very dry. So secretions, excellent. What else can you use to differentiate? Pupils, good. So the pupils in a nerve agent casualty would be what? Constricted or dilated? Constricted. Constricted, constricted. How about a bot victim? Dilated. dilated. So if you looked at Kern's pupils, his pupils would be very dilated. So you can use the presence or absence of secretions. You can use the size of the pupils. And then finally, we talked about the neuromuscular paralysis of nerve agent intoxication and of botulism. And the type of neuro neuromuscular paralysis with those two entities is very different. And you notice that when we lifted Curran's arm up, it just flopped right back down to the gurney. So he has a flaccid paralysis. And botulism would give you a very flaccid paralysis. What would the chemical agent, the nerve agent casualty, look like? Well, it could end up being flaccid, but first there's hyperactivity. Right, there's hyperactivity. So the nerve agent casualty generally starts out with a very spastic paralysis. He's twitching, he's spasming, he may even be seizing. So very easy to tell the difference between nerve agent intoxication and botulism based on size of the pupils, based on the type of paralysis, and based on the presence or absence of secretions. But there's an even easier way and a more important way to tell the difference. When would botulism present? You saw he presented three days after this alarm went off. And if you really believe that that alarm was occurred around the time of the exposure, then this took him several days to present. When would a nerve agent casualty present? Immediately. 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 And the, the point I like to make uh, is made by asking you, who decides whether Curran lives or dies out there on the battlefield? Who determines whether he's going to do well or not do well? You guys do. Right, absolutely. You're the medics. If you do the right thing, Curran might pull through. If you don't do the right thing, Curran might not pull through. On the other hand, who decides whether the chemical casualty lives or dies? The, the, the casualty, absolutely. He's out there on the battlefield, he gets exposed to nerve agent. He starts having symptoms immediately. He gives himself a Mark I, he may pull through. If his buddy gives him a Mark I, he may pull through. But if they don't give him the Mark I out there on the battlefield, chances are he's not going to make it to the 28 cash for you to have a chance at salvaging him. So this guy, did he present immediately or in delayed fashion? He presented in delayed fashion. So it's much more likely what? Chemical or biological? Right. Biological, right. So you've got a delayed casualty with a neuromuscular syndrome. Not much else that can be other than botulism. So you see how with a couple of minutes of training, you guys can readily differentiate pulmonary versus neuromuscular syndrome, immediately, uh, immediate versus delayed presentation. This is a delayed presentation of a neuromuscular syndrome, must be botulism, not much else that can be out there on the battlefield. So great job, again, in two minutes worth of training, you guys have shown that you can 
readily manage these types of patients on the battlefield. The tough part is going to be sorting this guy out from everybody with the flu and mono and malingering and all that kind of stuff. Ooh. Ooh. Where should that guy have been? That guy. Um, that patient. <laughs> that guy. That guy. <laughs> Cezac, where are you from? <laughs> Good. I'm from Ohio. <laughs> Good. Uh, I thought, Ted, there was one point about that scenario that was a little bit unrealistic, in that Kern, the patient, uh, it, based on my experience with monkeys, would have probably been on a ventilator See. had he had that degree of peripheral paralysis. That's, uh, I, I think you're time. right, sir. I think you're right. That's where right. he should have been. That's where he should have been, right. on the ventilator. I just want to translate, hua. Uh, for the Air Force people out there, that would okay. translate as aim high. All right. I've been hearing that a lot. All right. Why don't we go on now to the next toxin uh, agent, staphylococcal enteroxin. Enterotoxin. I practice that too. <laughs> B or SEB. Now, you may recognize the name staph toxin as a common cause of food poisoning. That's right. As a naturally occurring disease, uh, SEB disease or staph enterotoxin B disease uh, is a very common cause uh, of food poisoning outbreaks. It's a relatively quick acting toxin. Uh, it causes vomiting, uh, maybe some diarrhea, usually no fever. Again, that's the thing the intoxications have in common is generally they don't produce fever, whereas infections do. Uh, it generally resolves uh, pretty quickly. It's an incapacitating agent, so basically you feel, you feel great, you feel fine one minute, uh, then the next minute you wish you were dead. Uh, you may wish you were dead for 24 hours or so, and then you feel fine again. Okay, so this is what a terrorist would want to cause with this particular agent then? Well, Dr. France, I don't know, what would a terrorist want to want to do with SCB? Well, I Doris, if you've ever experienced the abdominal cramps mm -hmm. that follow ingestion of these toxins, you probably know it can clearly be incapacitating. Uh, the same kinds of effect, but much more targeted on the airways, okay. uh, occur after inhalation of the agents. You get a, a severe pneumonia, you get uh, high fever, and uh, a lot of distress, and you'll be down in bed uh, following, uh, following this, uh, this kind of an exposure. You know, Colonel France, I want to ask you a question that I asked uh, in an analogous fashion yesterday. We talked about Venezuelan equine encephalitis yesterday, and I asked why VEE, -E, why not EEE, -E, why not WEE? -E? Same thing with this. We hear a lot about SEB uh, as a weapon. Uh, why not staph enterotoxin A? Why not staph enterotoxin C, uh, for example? Why do we focus on staph enterotoxin B uh, as a weapon? I think it may be uh, analogous to the situation that occurred in Iraq. Uh, talking to Bill Patrick and some of the old timers from the, our, our U.S. Offensive Biological Warfare Program that began in the late 40s, actually, almost 50 years ago, uh, they looked at all the enterotoxins initially, and they found that they were able to grow this, this uh, SEB to higher concentrations more effectively and more easily than any of the others, so they selected it. All right, would this that. be a lethal agent then? Certainly it can be an, a lethal agent. It was originally selected as an incapacitant during our old program. Then when, when they did some animal studies uh, and, and uh, other studies with this, this agent, they found that it was probably a little more likely to be a lethal agent than they had originally anticipated. I think what you would see uh, with an exposure is a lot of sick people but you'd also uh, see some deaths in untreated uh, populations. Okay, Mark, how does it work? Well, these agents are, are called super antigens, and as such, they bind to the major histocompatibility complex on immune cells. This results in T cell proliferation and the massive release of cytokines and lymphokines, which accounts for the symptomatology. You know, clinically, this mechanism of action would result in a sudden onset of fever, uh, headaches, chills, muscle aches, uh, a non-productive cough. Some of the more severe cases uh, would then progress to uh, respiratory difficulty, uh, retrosternal chest pain. Uh, the fever that one sees uh, with SEB inhalational disease, which you don't see uh, with uh, ingested SEB, uh, can last as long as five days and can range as high as 103 to 106 degrees. Uh, if people inadvertently swallow the toxin, and I think you could see how that would happen if you're uh, overwhelmed by an aerosol dose, obviously some of it's going to get on your lips and mm -hmm. tongues and gum. You may ingest some of that. And if you do, uh, then you will see the gastrointestinal symptomatology as well, the nausea, the vomiting, uh, and the diarrhea. There's a good chance uh, that the patient uh, who is uh, attacked with SEB may not be able to return to duty uh, for as long as two to four weeks. All right. Is there any way to uh, diagnose SEB? 
Well, uh, as it sounds, uh, it's a rather nonspecific disease uh, in appearance, so it is very tough uh, to diagnose definitively. Uh, in more severe cases, one can see pulmonary edema. Uh, that may tip you off, but again, even that's pretty nonspecific. The chest x-ray uh, in these cases is generally normal, even in uh, some of the patients with a significant amount of respiratory uh, symptomatology. Atelectasis and pulmonary edema uh, and ARDS, though, can uh, be seen on some chest x-rays. Um, what about laboratory findings, Mark? Any laboratory findings that would help us? For SEB, it's, we're able to detect it immunologically in the urine, believe it or not, and also with a little bit more trouble in the serum. So a physician or an aid station personnel who suspects SEB, uh, I would ask them to take nasal swabs uh, once again, and also both acute and convalescent serum and urine samples. Okay, Dr. France, is there any treatment or prevention for this toxin? Uh, unfortunately, Doris, there's no specific treatment for the toxin. It would be a case of treating symptomatically, tr uh, treating the symptoms. Most patients would actually do quite well. Uh, if there is underlying disease, however, it, it could be a, a very invasive intoxication. And this could go on for two to three weeks. Uh, with regard to prophylaxis, there is no licensed or IND vaccine for use in humans at this time. However, we have some very promising, again, recombinant uh, candidates in the, uh, in the tech base, not only for SEB, but for the other staphylococcal endurotoxins. Uh, they have not been tested in humans, but they are very effective in animal models, in inhalation animal models in non-human primates. All right. Well, let's move along to the next toxin, which is ricin, and I know that this toxin comes from castor beans. That's uh, right, Doris. Ricin is derived from a common plant, the castor bean. I was supposed to show some castor bean seeds here. Your ex-husband stopped me in the hallway and I gave them to him. Um, you, can buy them, you can buy those commercially uh, and you can use them to grow the plant that you see here, the ricinus communist plant. This plant is grown worldwide uh, because of the castor bean that it produces. Uh, and those castor beans are used in the production of castor oil. And here you can see uh, very beautiful beans often used to make necklaces as well. Um, this is a castor bean production plant in Thailand. And again, uh, this stuff is used all over the world for a variety of, uh, of indications. You know, my mother used to use this stuff on me. The delivery system was a spoon, and I, I was sure she was trying to kill That's me. Right. It was a biological <laughs> weapon. Right. <laughs> it's, still, it's still out there. It's still being produced. However, it used to be more of an intestinal lubricant. Now we use it more as an industrial lubricant. That's what my mother said. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's grown worldwide. In, in tropical climates, uh, over a million tons of beans are pressed annually for the, for the oil. Uh, the protein cake, as such, is 3 to 5 percent ricin by weight. Hmm. Okay, so you know that it's out there. You know, ricin was used, and I think we mentioned this uh, earlier in the show, it was used as an assassin, uh, assassination weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, the Georgi Markov story, the, the Bulgarian gentleman who was assassinated in 1978 um, at, at a London bus stop, he was injected with that uh, ricin-containing pellet. Um, so we know it can make people uh, sick, we know it can in fact uh, kill people, and we know it's something that obviously uh, terrorists have been able to get their hands on it. Uh, I think Dr. France uh, probably can share, us, uh, share with us uh, some more anecdotes of uh, how terrorists might have uh, employed this. There have been a couple of interesting cases uh, actually in the 90s. There were uh, two tax protesters in the Midwest that were attempting to intoxicate some, some uh, public servants in some way. They were arrested in 1995 and charged under the Anti-Terrorism Act. In fact, it was the, the first case of uh, use of the Anti-Terrorism Act for possession of biological weapons. Uh, there was another case of a worker uh, from the Trans-Alaska Pipeline that first brought some beans back with him, moved to Arkansas, was arrested again under the, the uh, Anti-Terrorism Act and subsequently hung himself. Uh, in his jail cell. This happened just a couple of years ago. I think this demonstrates the popularity of, of ricin. And as I mentioned earlier, it's toxicity, ease of production, and stability that uh, a proliferator or a terrorist might look at. And in this case, uh, ricin scores very highly in ease of production and availability. And I think also the popularization by the press has probably advertised this to some degree, uh, the Georgie Markov case, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember we mentioned that ricin wouldn't be good on the battlefield. Well, that's, that's really correct. Uh, even though ricin is stable and quite toxic by aerosol, because it's not quite as toxic as some things such as bot toxin, it really would require ton quantities on the battlefield. However, as, as I mentioned before, there's 
million tons of castor beans are pressed every year, ton quantities really can be available, and for that reason, we still worry about it. You know, American physicians were never able to study uh, Georgi Markov to learn from his case. Have there been any cases that we can maybe learn the signs and symptoms of ricin intoxication from? Well, Ted, there's a famous review paper that, uh, that was published in 1985 that reviewed all the cases of ingestion of ricin, uh, either beans or toxin, that had occurred in the U.S. to that point. It was some more than 700 cases. I was surprised when I first read that to see that only 14 uh, of those patients had actually died. Um, and in the following ingestion, at least, either in the serious or fatal cases, we see very similar signs. And those are uh, rapid, by rapid I mean within a few hours, onset of severe GI signs, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and then bloody diarrhea and cramps, and for those who died, eventually a shock-like syndrome. I'm not aware of any cases of inhalation of the toxin in humans and the resultant uh, disease. However, uh, in and around the, the, the uh, castor bean plants, castor oil plants that Mark mentioned, we see cases of inhalation of proteins that come from the beans. These are typically allergic kinds of responses with wheezing, uh, tightness of the chest, and so on, and they respond to the normal therapies for, for that kind of a uh, syndrome. So then after inhalation exposure, then you would see mostly lung injury? Almost entirely. Uh, if you give the toxin either IV or IP or sub-Q, you see one kind of a syndrome. If you s give the toxin by inhalation, you see almost entirely a, a pulmonary syndrome. And this is a severe pneumonia, a necrotizing pneumonia, mm. in which the airways and the alveoli uh, become necrotic. Uh, this is a, a gross slide from uh, a, an animal model that was, was challenged in this way. You can, you can see the hemorrhage in this slide. And you also see eventually alveolar flooding. This is likely the cause of death in uh, inhalation uh, intoxication. For the clinician uh, out there, that would translate, uh, obviously, uh, into bilateral infiltrates on chest x-ray. But I think you all realize that's a pretty nonspecific finding by now. Anything else, Mark, that might help us diagnostically? Well, yes. Uh, ricin is one toxin that we can detect immunologically in the serum. And also, because ricin is such a highly immunogenic toxin, in the convalescent serum, several days or, or a week or two out, we can often detect antibodies uh, against ricin, which can, can help and make that diagnosis. I would, again, uh, uh, hope that the physician seeing the patients would uh, take both acute and convalescent serum samples. All right. Um, how would you treat it? Well, Doris, uh, as with many of these diseases, it's nonspecific treatment. I don't know if Colonel France has anything more to add to that. It would be simply symptomatic uh, care. Non mm -hmm. there, there is no specific therapy for ricin intoxication. You need to remember to keep up the, the, with the fluids, keep up with the uh, intravenous hydration. That would certainly be a key component of supportive care. Uh, those with inhalational exposure would need uh, appropriate treatment for pulmonary edema and respiratory support, the same type of support you would provide for any patient with severe ARDS. Uh, or like uh, symptoms. Okay, are there any protective measures? There's no vaccine available yet, although we do have one in the pipeline. The best way to protect yourself against ricin is actually wearing a protective mask. Uh, protective masks are very effective in filtering out the toxin, and it's not dermally active, so you don't have to worry about that route. Okay. Let's start now on our last agent of the entire three-day course, the T2 mycotoxins. Now, if I remember correctly, we talked about these last year, and um, are they, but they're not really common knowledge. They're not really widely known. These are fungal metabolites, and there's a whole range of them. There's over 40 of them. They're usually associated with grains and nuts. Uh, they're a significant human health and agricultural problem in underdeveloped and developing nations. Uh, many people, while haven't heard much about these particular toxins, you may have heard of yellow rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds familiar, but what happened with it? Dr. France? Uh, I might comment on that, Doris. There are some, this is a, a very controversial issue that occurred in the late 70s and early 80s. There were reports of a yellow material, yellow sticky material that was delivered from aircraft in remote areas of Laos, uh, Kampuchea, and Afghanistan. Uh, there were reports of thousands of human and animal deaths. Uh, investigators were sent in in an attempt to, to collect samples. They did collect samples from of leaves, uh, of some tree bark and soil and rocks, brought them back to the U.S. 
and in a small number of cases, uh, did a small percentage of the samples were positive for a toxin called a trichothecin toxin called T2. And I think it was controversial uh, because of the re remoteness of the area, the difficulty in obtaining good information about human cases, and the fact that it was a relatively small percentage of the samples that were actually positive. Okay. Well, other than that, uh, are there any naturally occurring diseases with uh, mycotoxins? Oh, many. Uh, as I said, this has been a, a huge agricultural and public health problem for forever. Uh, aflatoxins are some of the most potent natural carcinogens we know. Uh, they're very potent uh, liver carcinogens. A T2 toxin, even when taken um, internally, has been known to cause something called toxic, uh, elementary toxic eleukia. Uh, okra toxin, uh, another fungal metabolite from moldy grain, is the source of bulk and endemic nephropathy. And the list goes on and on. There's many. You know, for the American clinician, I think these have been very, very obscure syndromes. And I personally never really had a good clinical correlate to, to uh, associate this with uh, until fairly recently. And I think many American clinicians are familiar with the fact that uh, a while back, a short while back, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, 18 infants uh, became ill. And unfortunately, three of those infants actually died. Mm -hmm. uh, and this epidemic was worked up and traced to uh, something called stachyboitreous. Uh, toxin and stachyboitreous is a black mold uh, that was apparently growing to high titer uh, in the walls and dry drywall uh, of some of these houses in poorer areas mm. of Cleveland and it was postulated that inhaling the stachyboitreous uh, led to pulmonary hemorrhage uh, in these young infants so this is the first time I've really had a clinical correlate to some of these toxin diseases okay now these agents sound very different than the others is uh, one of these the one that can be absorbed through the skin uh, yes uh, the one agent that's dermally active, and we've alluded to that several times during this course, uh, is the T2 mycotoxin, the trichothecine mycotoxins. Uh, it could also be ingested after a terrorist attack and produce disease that way. Okay. Mark, how does it cause disease? Uh, this is a potent inhibitor of protein synthesis. Um, secondary to protein synthesis inhibition, you often find nucleic acid syn um, synthesis inhibition. Because of this, they act on rapidly proliferating tissues, such as the skin, the GI tract, and the erythropoietic system. Okay. Does it require any uh, kind of special decontamination? Well, it's a good question uh, that you bring up. We've stressed that for most of the biological agents, decon uh, is usually not necessary, especially if it's been uh, a day or more uh, after exposure, which because of the incubation periods, it's often going to be. Uh, even if you know, though, that someone's just been exposed, um, really all you need to do in most cases uh, for most biological agents that we're discussing in this course is the prudent use of bleach or uh, soap and water. Uh, and that works fine for almost everything out there. This agent, uh, again, uh, is the one that's a little bit of an exception. Uh, it works uh, more immediately than many of the other diseases. Uh, if someone's having uh, skin symptoms, this is one agent where uh, you may need to do decon uh, fairly quickly. Uh, and you would probably want to add uh, sodium hydroxide to the bleach that you're using to decon. Okay, what about the symptoms after exposure to the time? Well, the early symptoms that one would expect uh, would include uh, eye pain, uh, tearing, redness, uh, blurry vision. I think we've got actually an animation uh, that will depict this better than I can describe it. Here you see some soldiers in a field, uh, aircraft flies by and drops T2 mycotoxin, and then those toxin uh, particles uh, impinge uh, on the skin. Uh, they impinge on the conjunctiva as well. Uh, they can lead to reddening of the eyes, reddening of the conjunctiva. Uh, as the eye becomes more affected, uh, the vision can get blurry, and that can, of course, be a big problem uh, on the battlefield. Uh, not only, again, does this impinge on the eye, but it impinges on all the skin surfaces, and it can produce a significant amount of erythema uh, of the skin fairly rapidly. Uh, blistering uh, then ensues, and uh, in severe cases, the skin can actually become necrotic uh, and... Uh, uh, turn black and start to slough off, and I think all that's pretty well uh, depicted here. Uh, you can also see irritation and bleeding of mucous membranes, uh, and these can occur actually much quicker than with most uh, than the symptoms would occur with most biological agents. Sometimes in a matter of minutes. Okay. What happens after ingestion of the toxin? Well, after ingestion, there's a broad range uh, of uh, of symptoms that occur that include, uh, as you might expect, initially anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, then a, a a bloody, watery uh, diarrhea, and eventually multiple organ failure. And I think uh, Mark mentioned the fact that it is a protein synthesis inhibitor, so it's not surprising that you would see multiple organ, organ failure, uh, no matter what the root of, uh, of challenge. 
Okay. Is there any way to determine if exposure has occurred? Well, yes. There are immunological tests for a few of the mycotoxins. However, because there's a lack of cross-reactivity from toxin to toxin and, and test to test, unless you know exactly what you're dealing with, that's often not a good route. The best route is LCMS, or liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry. This is a very sensitive method. We can detect it in the serum and in animal studies. We've been able to detect metabolites out as late as 28 days. You know, like so many of these other toxins that we're uh, discussing, with the exception of botulism, of course, there's really no uh, specific treatment other than the supportive therapy uh, that we've been advocating. And unfortunately, uh, in the case of these mycotoxins, there's no currently available vaccine. Well, you obviously don't have time to put on any mop gear or anything to protect yourself. I mean, is there some kind of cream or something you can put on? Actually, uh, Dr. Bob Wanamaker at USAMRA did the studies uh, six or eight years ago that demonstrated that the chemical protective creams do work mm. in the case of the mycotoxins, and they protect the skin just like they do from the chemical The agents. topical skin protectant, TSP. Yes. Mm. All right. Okay. All right, well, many toxins uh, could be used, uh, theoretically. Uh, you heard Dr. Poli tell us that there were dozens and dozens of toxins. Um, we've only had time, obviously, to cover a very few uh, in this course. Uh, but now we're going to test you uh, with a short scenario. So You are the chief nurse assigned to the 167th Airlift Wing of the West Virginia Air National Guard. The 167th has been called to active duty in support of the ongoing mission in a Caribbean country. For the past two weeks, the unit has been ferrying supplies to a remote staging base, and from there, onward to the capital city. Recently, the situation there has destabilized. In multiple briefings, Joint Staff Intelligence has outlined evidence that enemy Special Operations Forces have engaged in a campaign to discredit U.S. peacekeeping forces there. Intelligence feels that the enemy is trying to make U.S. efforts appear incompetent, while portraying themselves as supporters of these Caribbean people. Apparently, some in the enemy government feel this will sway world opinion towards condemnation of the U.S. boycott of their country. Following a successful two-week stint in the Caribbean, the 167th prepares to return to Martinsburg, West Virginia. On the final day of their deployment, they are treated to a big luncheon in their honor. The luncheon features large quantities of fresh, traditional Caribbean seafood delicacies like conch, whelk, grouper, and amberjack. Beans, rice, and potato salad are also served. You and the medical crew director stay behind to begin preparing the aircraft for your return flight. Two hours after the luncheon ends, you're securing equipment inside the aircraft when a number of personnel from your unit start to feel sick to their stomachs. What's wrong? Oh, I'm sick in my stomach. I'm cramping really bad. Buddy, and I have tingling around my mouth. You're not having any chest pain, are you? No. Okay, short of breath? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, but my feet, mainly stomach? it's mainly my stomach and my toes and my fingers. Everything's getting numb. Mine too. My and I feel like a red. You feeling sick too? Uh, my fingers. Now, what, what's wrong? The stomach is kind of painful and just kind of had problems catching my breath. Ken Munoz? Yes. Uh, Sergeant Curry is here. Having, he's having trouble catching his breath. Oh, Sergeant Curry, you're having a lot of problems here? What's the matter? Well, so my curse a little. Do you need? I feel like I haven't you're... vomited. You have right, vomited, little... or you don't? No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, got a little cramping, but not much. But you're having difficulty breathing. Kind of okay. Catching my breath. Um, you think you'll be able to if I walk you back to the litter? That you'll be able to walk breathe. back and maybe yeah. uh, we can put you down. Oh okay. yeah. Why don't you undo the strap here? Okay. You gonna be okay? Okay. Um, we'll put that oxygen mask on your face. Okay. You just breathe normal. It hurts. Okay, use the bag if you start feeling sick. Sergeant Sorensen, uh -huh. you want to keep an eye on it, keep the oxygen. Ma'am, yes. my stomach. What's the matter? My stomach's Airman, bad. You're feeling sick on your stomach. Feel like I have to vomit. I'm, okay. I'm like. Look, um, did you just eat or did you eat at that banquet earlier today or? I, I, I was there. Okay, Sergeant Sorensen, um, did you eat the banquet by chance? Yes, ma'am, I did. Oh, are y'all still having stomach cramps? Yeah. Still feeling yeah. sick to your Excuse stomach? Me. Excuse me, yeah. Captain Fletcher. Yeah. How's it going back here? Do you have anyone that's not sick? I'm having, I have some individuals now? that are having the same symptoms, but I do have a couple individuals here that aren't experiencing any symptoms at all. They actually feel quite well. You guys could help yeah, them. I had everything to eat, like everyone else, except for I'm um, allergic to uh, shrimp and oysters. I didn't have those. Mm -hmm. 
Did all you guys eat at the banquet earlier today? Yes. Yeah. 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 Shellfish. You had shellfish. I ate everything. You ate everything? Yeah, a little bit of everything. I ate kind of everything but that slimy stuff. I'm not crazy about anything that, you know, has a sheen to it, so. I didn't eat that. And, and I had everything, a little bit of everything too, and I don't feel good. You didn't eat any uncooked uh, meats or no. fruits or vegetables? I think everything was cooked, yeah. Everything was cooked. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, well, we're back here with our studio audience, and we will test them and see what they think of this scenario. So the first question that I'd like to pose uh, to the studio audience is, what's going on here? What would explain the symptoms uh, that these airmen uh, exhibited? Dr. Knudsen. Well, we're thinking of uh, Revitoxin or maybe Saxitoxin as uh, sodium channel blockers because of the symptomology and uh, the fact that they've been eating these uh, uh, exotic shellfish okay. uh, since the saxitoxin um, is produced by or the brevitoxin produced by a dinoflagellate and the uh, shellfish are filter feeders it could concentrate in the shellfish and um, that would that would explain the symptoms you see these guys picked up on the fact that this was likely a toxin because it followed the toxin part of the video well, at least we know they want to sleep well, why could it could it be anything infectious and I know we're talking toxins, and, and those are certainly good thoughts, but are there any infectious diseases that explain this? Dr. Lee. The time course being such rapid onset points to a toxin rather than an infectious, which requires an incubation period. Okay, good, good. So very few infections would have. But what about the symptomatology would lead you to believe a toxin, and not a bacterial food poisoning, for instance? The, uh, the numbing, the uh, vomiting, um, we're also thinking that maybe uh, terodotoxin if they'd been puffer fish, but... Okay, uh, good. Okay, so there, there certainly were implicated foods that would um, produce bacterial types of food poisoning. For example, there was potato salad at the banquet. That's a common cause of uh, staph enterotoxin B uh, mediated uh, food poisoning. Um, I believe there was uh, rice, did they say? There so was, was rice. serious but, food poisoning. But there was also group or a large carnivore. Uh, and ciguatoxin would would fall into that category, which is also a marine uh, dinoflagellate produced toxin. I was sort of curious as why you stayed away from the ciguatoxin as a differential diagnosis. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, fir the first row has ciguatoxin in their differential. Okay. okay. Good. Good. Okay. Um, so uh, people are thinking toxin, and I assume the reason you're thinking toxin, other than the fact we just finished talking about toxins, is the incubation period here, two hours, I believe, the first people had symptoms, um, is shorter than one would expect with an infectious, if this were viral gastroenteritis mm -hmm. or a bacterial gastroenteritity uh, or something like that. The, I, I heard somebody mention the numbness and tingling of the lips. Uh, that doesn't... Uh, uh, ring a bell as far as I'm concerned uh, for any bacterial or viral disease and I think right. you're absolutely right that would point me that, in the direction was, uh, of mm -hmm. a toxin now right. the next question is is this endemic or is this sinister is this naturally occurring disease just happened to occur uh, in Lodobo uh, here or did somebody do something intentional sir, and how are you going to decide that sir it doesn't Lee. seem like it would necessarily be intentional especially since everybody um, appear to have these symptoms shortly after eating this banquet. The banquet could have been contaminated, but one would have to look at what was served and then try to trace that back as to exactly where it came from. Was it fresh? Was it under observation? Um, you know, did they get it from some street vendor off you know, the back of his truck? That's an excellent point. Um, however, there's a couple of things you need to think of. Uh, one, of course, brevitoxin, ciguatoxin, both endemic to that region. Saxitoxin, one of your other choices, is not endemic to, to that region, okay? That's more, a more northerly disease, northern California, Alaska, Canada. It doesn't occur down there. It does occur in the tropics in some areas, but not around Haiti. So that might, might help you in your diagnosis. One thing that you might also want to uh, figure out is to see whether or not any of your hosts got sick. Because if they got sick, then it's probably the food. If they did not, then you might... Um suspect terrorism. Also an excellent point. You need to go out and look into the indigenous population. Uh, if this is a local seafood problem, then civilians out there should also be getting sick. If nobody is sick except the people at your banquet, 
then that raises a whole host of other questions. That's right. And in fact, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. That kind of gets us to question four uh, in the student activity. Question four says, you know, the commander wants to know if this is intentional. He's uh, got his uh, finger on the pulse of the National Command Authority. He needs to report back to his boss. He needs to advise his boss uh, what to do about this. So he has a very vested interest in deciding whether this is intentional or sinister. And, and you've got to help him make that decision. And we've already talked about uh, some of the ways you're going to help to make that decision. So let me just review. The information that you're going to get is whether this is, uh, in fact, that whether these diseases, brevitoxin, saxitoxin, ciguatoxin, uh, are endemic to Lidobo uh, or not. Uh, that's one question. Um, whether uh, the local populace has been affected. Uh, in other words, we know people at the banquet uh, were infected, the soldiers, or airmen rather, the local dignitaries. But how about the local Lidobans uh, who are out there? Have they been affected? And what would that tell you? If they were affected, what would that tell you? Well, it suggests that it's a naturally occurring event, right. perhaps. More, more likely it's naturally occurring if the local population uh, is seeing that disease as well. And I don't think we've mentioned it uh, yet, but there's this phenomenon of red tides. And I believe uh, we have a still shot uh, in our bank here that will show us what a red tide looks like. And in the case of uh, brevitoxin and saxitoxin-mediated disease, that would be uh, an important part of history. Have any red tides uh, been noticed uh, in the local area? Because saxitoxin and brevitoxin-mediated diseases are associated with these blooms. Um, Ed Eitzen, uh, who was on the show on the first day and who will be on the show later today, is an Auburn uh, grad. And he tells me these crimson tides are uh, <laughs> comprised of very, very primitive life forms. Uh, but that would be uh, a crimson tide. We have also another shot that I think shows uh, another sort of a, a, a crimson tide. And Mark, I wonder if you could maybe comment oh, on this. This. Is, this is an artificial red tide that occurred around one of the islands in Biscayne Bay a few years ago. Uh, no human health effects were noted from this. Isn't that the same artist who puts yeah. buildings in chocolate? And yeah. Oh, yeah, and long strings of laundry across the southwest. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. His name's Christos, okay. by the way. <laughs> Christos. Okay. So uh, you got some information uh, that was subsequently mm. provided to you that says um, that uh, there have been no red tides uh, seen uh, lately anywhere near uh, Lidobo, but there was a red tide reported off of uh, the American uh, Keys, the Florida Keys, um, there have been no uh, civilians in the populace uh, affected by similar toxin-mediated diseases. Uh, what are you thinking now? Well, I wonder where the fish was caught. I mean, okay, if the good. fish came from where the red tide had been noti right. n noticed, that may... So it probably wasn't local. You're not okay. seeing anybody affected. Probably well, not local. Mark. We need to step back one step here, because at the time of the outbreak, you're not going to be able to tell the difference initially between a neurotoxic shellfish poisoning or brevitoxin intoxication and ciguatera poisoning. Many of the symptoms are, are identical. In this case, we have another clue. Is, can, does anybody, did anybody pick up on the clue that, that differentiates the brevitoxin intoxication from ciguatera? Because ciguatera is endemic to Haiti, and it could very well have been the grouper or the yellowtail or the king mackerel that was served at the banquet. Sir, didn't they bring up that the that um, several of the members who did not become sick did not eat the oysters and the Very shrimp? Very good. You were paying attention. Um, yes, exactly. The people who didn't eat shellfish didn't get sick. And ciguatera is never caused by shellfish. It's only caused by large reef-dwelling carnivores. So the fact that you can pin it on the shellfish now makes brevitoxin the, the primary culprit. I think they gave a history also of uh, these two uh, airmen who had CQ duty. They were back manning the telephones at the shop. Uh, they were brought their platters uh, later, and they were out of conch and whelk. So those uh, two, two airmen didn't get any of the conch and whelk, and they did exactly. not get sick. So that would implicate um, conch and whelk. Um, and I think this just all highlights the importance of epidemiology in general. And again, I've been harping on you for three days now uh, about the importance of being an amateur epidemiologist. And I realize I'm certainly not going to make you all professional, uh, board-certified preventive medicine officers. But uh, epidemiology is still important. You, know how to, you need to know how to do a garden variety, gumshoe, quick and dirty uh, right. epidemiologic assessment. And you can see here uh, the value of that. And I think you're all thinking, oh, this isn't fair. You know, we talked about uh, four mm -hmm. toxins. We didn't talk about brevitoxin. 
And in fact, it, in that sense, it's not fair. And we picked brevitoxin just for grins, but this could easily have been saxitoxin or ciguatoxin or uh, tetrodotoxin or fugu uh, poisoning or any one uh, of a zillion other marine or bacterial or uh, reptilian toxins. And uh, the importance here is not necessarily the identity of the toxin. Uh, Dr. Poli, I'm sure, uh, would love for you to correctly identify this as brevitoxin. And oh, yeah. he can do that in his laboratory. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you can do that clinically, that's great. You get. Uh, a merit badge and an extra credit uh, and maybe even an Army Achievement Medal. Uh, but the important point is, can you figure out whether this is normal right. or abnormal? Can you figure out whether an epidemic is really even occurring in the first place? And can you figure out whether this is uh, sinister or whether this is endemic disease? Let me ask you one last set of questions. What would you do for these affected individuals? Yeah. Um, I think uh, activated charcoal would be uh, warranted and uh, gastric lavage if it's done immediately. Okay. Excellent point, but the key qualifier here is if it's done immediately. And these people who are already symptomatic, uh, it's too late. If you had a situation where everybody ate at the banquet, they all got sick, uh, but there were some people who didn't get to eat because they were working and somebody put a platter in the refrigerator uh, for them and they came along later and started eating and you caught them, uh, you know, they had started eating but they weren't yet sick, those people would be great candidates for charcoal gut decontamination. But these people who are already symptomatic, uh, unfortunately it's yeah. too late. Well, Ex excellent point. Your window of opportunity for charcoal is probably under 12 hours, okay? Um, you may, it, it may not be too late at the very onset of symptoms, but certainly 8 to 12 hours maximum is about all your window of opportunity is. And if you don't get it by then, then charcoal is really not going to help. What about decon? These patients need deconing? No, patients don't need deconning. Uh, this so stuff is not does. contagious. <laughs> the food needs deconning, so I decon the food down the garbage disposal. Actually, no. what I'd probably do is send the food to Dr. Right. Foley's You line. collect it, you right. put my name right. on it, right. and you send it back to That's you, right. Samrid. That's right. In, well, in addition to uh, some serum specimens? Yes. However, at this point in time, we cannot detect, we, we don't know that we can detect brevitoxin in serum after about somewhere in the first 24 hours. However, working on it, I can detect it in urine out at least 24 to 48 hours. So urine samples would be nice. Timed urine samples uh, over at least 24 to 48 to 72 hours if you can get them. Uh, that would help us determine the pharmaco pharmacology uh, and the pharmacokinetics of absorption and excretion. All of that is nice from a scientific standpoint. Uh, for, for you, I can help diagnose the problem. But I would like serum and urine collection. OK. Any questions from you? I think there are a couple of other things that we need to consider with regard to this. Uh, one is that we have a military unit that's out of commission. And somebody needs to receive that report. And the second thing is we have a breakdown in the food procurement, food preparation chain. And I think someone has to go back and ask uh, who inspected the food items, who procured them, and who gave the okay for this event. Excellent, excellent point. And just highlights uh, the military need in general to pass information up the chain of command and down the chain of command. Except there's an important point here is that if this were ciguatoxin, it is bravitoxin, these foodstuffs are perfectly fresh, perfectly healthy, other than the toxin. You can't, you can't catch these by inspection. You'll never see it. They smell right, they look right, they're fresh. Uh, this is not an inspection issue. Okay, well that about wraps it up and uh, you guys have done as usual a great job.